This may shock you, but most bands don't stay together in their original form forever. There are plenty of instances of lesser-known musicians landing the dream gig of playing in legendary bands, only to find that fans have put away their lighters and are now lofting pitchforks. Founding Van Halen member David Lee Roth may not be the greatest vocalist on earth, but he is the consummate showman and a perfect fit for the fun-loving Southern California rockers. Fans of the band were split when veteran vocalist Sammy Hagar replaced Roth and they released 5150 in 1986. His vibe was certainly different from Roth's, but the band cranked out some of their biggest hits with him. But after a decade, he'd had enough with the infighting. For his replacement, Eddie Van Halen and the boys turned to former Extreme lead singer Gary Sharon. The move looked good on paper, but unfortunately, albums aren't recorded on paper. Sharon made his debut on the band's 11th album, Van Halen 3. And while he acquitted himself fairly admirably, fans found him a less-than-ideal choice. That is to say, they couldn't stand him. After three years, Sharon departed, telling Rolling Stone, "...some of the fans will never want me or anyone else in the band." The Who's Keith Moon was one of the most insanely gifted drummers of all time. He was simply irreplaceable, but that didn't stop the band from trying. After his deadly 1978 drug overdose, they turned to former Faces drummer Kenny Jones, a well-regarded professional and drinking buddy of guitarist Pete Townsend. Jones struggled to adapt to the band's changing, more commercial sound, manning the skins for only two albums before he was officially let go in 1989. In a 1994 interview with Goldmine magazine, lead singer Roger Daltrey said of Jones, "...I didn't dislike the guy, but I just felt he wasn't the right drummer for The Who." When iconic vocalist Bruce Dickinson left Iron Maiden in 1993 to focus on a solo career, the band auditioned a slew of potential replacements. They settled on former Wolfsbane singer Blaze Bailey, even though his vocal style was completely different from Dickinson's. Although he was an accomplished vocalist, Bailey couldn't win over the band's fans, who probably would have preferred a Bruce Dickinson-shaped cardboard cutout. Bailey lasted only three years and two albums before Dickinson gave the fans what they wanted and returned to the group. In 2014, Bailey told rock journalist Mitch LaFon, "...there were a lot of people who blamed me for Bruce leaving, which is a classic girlfriend problem, where you blame your friend for your girlfriend leaving or whatever." When your lead singer has one of the most instantly recognizable voices in the world, replacing him isn't quite as simple as placing an ad on Craigslist. Just ask the venerable prog rock band Yes, which has struggled during multiple periods to maintain its identity without singer John Anderson and his crazy vocal range. When health problems forced Anderson out in 2008, the remaining members saddled up with Benoit David, formerly the lead singer in a Yes cover band, without even telling Anderson. Fans were unimpressed with the new karaoke version of their favorite band, and Anderson himself lobbed a few disses their way in a Rolling Stone interview, saying, "...I wasn't really convinced. The new singer is singing good, but it sounded a bit dated to me." For fans of Scott punk outfit Sublime, 1996 was the ultimate double-edged sword. The band finally achieved commercial success with their self-titled third album, scoring a number one single with What I Got. But this was mere months after the death of lead singer Bradley Knoll. In accordance with Knoll's wishes, the band broke up rather than carry on without him. That changed in 2009, when the remaining members recruited new singer and guitarist Rome Ramirez, a sublime superfan with the advantage of knowing all the band's songs, but the disadvantage of being a really bad singer. The new lineup was dragged into court by Knoll's family over their use of the sublime name. The court ruled against the band, so they tacked With Rome onto the end of their moniker and went about their business. About a decade and two poorly received albums later, the band continues to tour and perform. Longtime Red Hot Chili Peppers backup tour guitarist Josh Klinghoffer officially stepped in for departing Axeman John Frusciante in 2009, replacing Frusciante's virtuoso funk craziness with a decidedly more minimalist style. To his credit, he never intended to replicate what Frusciante brought to the band. But given his tendency to constantly second-guess whether he's sufficiently living up to his predecessor's legacy, it might have been better if he had. The strong contention of fans still pining for Frusciante's return doesn't exactly help. Klinghoffer can get a little testy on the subject of his predecessor, as when he told Metro News, "...of course it gets annoying. All these comparisons are simply absurd." When Ozzy Osbourne departed Black Sabbath to embark on a solo career in 1979, the band found perhaps the only musician capable of replacing his distinctive shriek in Ronnie James Dio, one of the most powerful metal vocalists to ever live. 
But even Dio's tenure was divisive among fans. So when he left to start his own eponymous group in 1983, some might have expected Sabbath to seek out a singer who was a bit more like Ozzy. Instead, they turned to former Deep Purple vocalist Ian Gillen, who was the exact opposite. Gillen came on board for the band's 1983 release Born Again, an experiment in clashing styles that made headbangers bang their heads against their stereos. Not even Gillen's soaring voice could hide his corny lyrics, which rubbed up uneasily against Sabbath's dark, gloomy vibe. I mean, just everyone was bursting into laughter, you know, it was absolutely horrendous. The collaboration only lasted for that one album, after which Gillen returned to Deep Purple and Sabbath fans were left wondering how anyone thought the pairing was a good idea. As guitarist Tony Iommi recounted in an interview years later with Hard Music TV, he invited Gillen to join the band after the two got drunk off their faces at an Oxford pub. That explains it. Vince Neil was the face of Motley Crue throughout the band's 80s heyday. At the end of that decade, they notched their greatest commercial success with 1989's Dr. Feelgood. The album went straight to number one and remained on the charts for a staggering 114 weeks. A few years later, Nirvana came along to jerk the rug out from under purveyors of so-called hair metal. Undeterred, the band regrouped to follow up their biggest record, but then Neil bolted due to internal disagreements. The crew recruited John Karabi, the former frontman of little-known band The Scream. By the time Karabi made his first appearance on the band's self-titled 1994 release, a perfect storm of indifference was brewing. Label Elektra, in the middle of a major shakeup, couldn't be bothered to promote it. Neil's absence meant even fans who were aware of the record's release generally held it in open contempt. It was Karabi's lone outing with the band. Neil returned for 1997's Generation Swine. Still, not everyone thinks Karabi's tenure should be consigned to the trash heap of metal history. Guitarist Mick Mars said in an interview, I'll probably get kicked in the nuts for this, but I thought it was a really great album. After an unfriendly breakup in 1986, the Dead Kennedys announced in 2001 that they were moving forward without lead singer Jello Biafra. The band had a lot of options for replacing Biafra's frantic, swaggering stage persona and bleeding vocal style. They ended up picking Brandon Cruz, the former lead singer of punk band Dr. No. He seemed like a choice specifically engineered to make Kennedys fans flip their mohawks. Cruz wasn't just any old punker. He began his career as a child actor. He achieved considerable fame in the 1970s as the star of The Courtship of Eddie's Father opposite future Hulk Bill Bixby. His tenure in the Kennedys became an immediate lightning rod for controversy. Biafra regarded Cruz as little more than a scab singer, alleging that Cruz had modified his stage presence to more closely match Biafra's. Biafra said the reformed band was essentially pulling a bait and switch on fans. He sued for damages. The suit went nowhere, likely because Cruz bailed after just a couple years to be replaced by a succession of less notable singers. After the tragic suicide of lead singer Michael Hutchins in 1997, Australian rock band NXS carried on with a number of temporary singers before deciding to permanently replace Hutchins in 2005 via a reality show. Rock star NXS pitted 15 contestants against each other for a chance to rock in the big leagues. Despite being the underdog to fan favorite Marty Casey, Canadian singer JD Fortune won. You are right for our band NXS. You are the rock star! He joined the band on tour and for the recording of the 2005 album Switch. Before his big win, Fortune had been broke, homeless, and living in his car. While an adequate replacement, Fortune admitted that he had become addicted to cocaine. At the end of a 23-month tour, the band let him know that his services would no longer be required by giving him a handshake and leaving him at an airport in Hong Kong. The unfortunate singer ended up in the exact same situation he had been in before his big win, homeless and broke. It sounds like the plot of a kid's movie. A mild-mannered, rock-and-roll-loving teen gets asked to join a famous band. That's the actual life story of the bassist who replaced Michael Anthony in Van Halen in 2007. That replacement musician was Wolfgang Van Halen, son of guitarist Eddie Van Halen and nephew of drummer Alex Van Halen. In 2009, Eddie Van Halen told Rolling Stone that he had to bring in his boy because Anthony quit the group to join former Van Halen singer Sammy Hagar's band Chickenfoot. Anthony told Music Radar, I never quit Van Halen. No way. He'd previously told Rock Daily that Eddie Van Halen had been trying to get rid of him since 2004, saying, Eddie Van Halen was always put off that I was going out and playing with Sammy when we weren't doing anything. Van Halen said goodbye to Anthony's decades of experience on the bass and his prominent backup vocals to bring in a new bass player who was only 16 when he joined the group. For almost 60 years, the Beach Boys have been a family affair, including brothers Brian, Carl, and Dennis Wilson, plus their cousin Mike Love and friend Al Jardine. 
Dennis Wilson died in a drowning accident in 1983, leaving the Beach Boys crushed and in need of a drummer. Several musicians have filled in on tour and in the studio, but for more than 30 years, the most prominent one has been John Stamos, Uncle Jesse from Full House. According to a Mike Love radio interview in 2016, Stamos is a Beach Boys superfan and befriended some of the group back in 1982. Stamos played percussion on select concert dates and in the video for the band's 1988 hit Kokomo. The Beach Boys returned the favor with a guest stint on Full House, backing up Stamos's in-character performance of the love ballad Forever. After years as a British blues rock band, Fleetwood Mac recruited Americans Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. Buckingham's agile guitar work and Nix's spooky, deeply personal songwriting and vocals propelled Fleetwood Mac's 1977 album Rumors to sell more than 40 million copies. Buckingham left the band in 2018. According to a source close to the situation, who spoke to Variety, Buckingham didn't quit. The rest of Fleetwood Mac wanted to tour, but Buckingham wanted to focus on solo work. The group reportedly got so tired of waiting for Buckingham that they told him they were going on the road without him. Just a huge impasse uh, and hit a brick wall where we, we decided that we had to part company. The band hired two accomplished musicians to fill the void, Neil Finn of Crowded House and Mike Campbell of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Beyond vocals and a distinctive guitar style, the new Fleetwood Mac suffered the loss of what Jim Harrington of the Mercury News called intangibles, such as passion and power and heart and soul, as well as chemistry with Nicks, with whom Buckingham once had a tumultuous relationship. ACDC weathered the tragic loss of singer Bon Scott in 1980 by replacing him with Brian Johnson. Johnson and ACDC pressed on, filling arenas with their rock songs about rock until it all fell apart. Guitarist Malcolm Young left the band in 2014 due to escalating health issues. Drummer Phil Rudd was out later that year after pleading guilty to threatening to kill an assistant. Replacements filled out the lineup when the group headed out for its Rocker Bus tour in 2015. Then, Johnson's doctors diagnosed him with profound hearing loss. They said if he continued performing, he'd go completely deaf. ACDC opted to continue with the tour, but they needed a high-profile singer who could hit the high notes. One man fit the bill. Axl Rose, the frontman of Guns N' Roses. ACDC fans still flocked to see the band, but some weren't impressed. Rudd told the New Zealand Herald that he'd never return to the band if Rose is still around. The drummer also told the Bay of Plenty Times, I don't want to play with Axl Rose. I don't really rate him. Alice in Chains was one of Seattle's biggest grunge bands, releasing radio staples like No Excuses, Rooster, and Wood. All the while, singer Lane Staley struggled with drugs. After a show in July 1996, he overdosed on heroin. He lived, but would never perform live with Alice in Chains again. In 2002, his body was found at home after a fatal dose of cocaine and heroin. Guitarist Jerry Cantrell embarked on a solo career. A band called Comes With The Fall served as both his opening act and backing musicians. When Alice in Chains decided to reunite, Comes With The Fall's William Duvall was an obvious pick to replace Staley. He auditioned and beat out candidates such as Vin Dombrowski of Sponge and Scott Weiland of Stone Temple Pilots. Duvall doesn't imitate Staley, which might be the problem since he's singing another man's very personal songs about addiction. Mark Beaumont of The Guardian called Duvall a charismatic presence but said the reformulated Alice in Chains was both a tribute act to themselves and a touring public health warning against substance abuse. The Doors sound is wrapped up in the cult of personality surrounding singer Jim Morrison. Recognizing that replacing its iconic frontman after his death would be foolhardy, The Doors at first carried on without Morrison. Guitarist Robbie Krieger and keyboardist Ray Manzarek split vocal duties on two forgettable albums. The remaining Doors reunited in 2000 at the behest of VH1 storytellers. In between Krieger, Manzarek, and drummer John Dinsmore telling 60s stories, guest singers sat in, including Scott Weiland of Stone Temple Pilots and Ian Astbury of alternative band The Cult. Singing it for us, yes indeed. Ian Astbury from The Cult! Astbury and Doors biographer Danny Sugarman were friends. Sugarman frequently recommended the singer, despite his having a completely different style than Morrison. The Doors toured in 2002 with Astbury as Riders on the Storm. Why the name change? Because it upset the Doors' Dinsmore so much that he sued. He said, it can't be the Doors without Jim. It could be the windows, the hinges, I don't care, as long as it's not the Doors. Guitarist Tom DeLonge and bassist Mark Hoppus shared vocal duties in Blink-182 for years. Hits including First Date and What's My Age Again made them one of the most popular pop-punk bands ever. Fans were surprised when DeLonge left the band under mysterious circumstances in 2015. 
Hoppus and drummer Travis Barker said in a statement, We are all set to play this festival and record a new album, and Tom kept putting it off without reason. A week before we were scheduled to go into the studio, we got an email from his manager explaining that he didn't want to participate in any Blink-182 projects indefinitely. DeLong subsequently told fans via Instagram, I never quit the band. In the same statement announcing DeLong's exit, Blink-182 announced his replacement, Alkaline Trio guitarist Matt Skiba. Skiba told Ultimate Guitar that his arrival received a mixed response. There were some people who were like, this is an amazing fit, and some Tom loyalists who were like, F you. Some expressed their distaste on Skiba's Instagram page, saying his guitar was ugly, telling him that last album sucked, and noting, your time is up. Skiba responded in kind, saying, get a new face, you f***ing jive turkey. The band Chicago had a ton of hits in the 80s thanks to the combination of schmaltzy keyboards and the vaguely otherworldly vocals of singer Peter Cetera. Soft rock radio staples included You're the Inspiration, Hard to Say I'm Sorry, and Stay the Night. But classic rock stations also play songs by Chicago. Saturday in the Park and 25 or 6 to 4 are harder edged and more aggressive, and the big change came when Cetera took over as main lead singer, along with the assistance of songwriter and producer David Foster. In 1984, at the peak of its popularity, due to Cetera's style, he left the band for a solo career. The band promoted longtime band member Jason Sheff to lead singer duties, which he shared with Bill Champlin. Chef performed respectably for 30 years, but only one Chef-led song hit the top 40, What Kind of Man Would I Be, in 1989.